Hi hey everyone, David and Gino here taking a look at the other grade one race on Whitney Saturday at Saratoga. Race seven is the grade one Saratoga Derby Invitational. This one going a mile and three sixteenths on the Mellon Turf course for three-year-olds, the second leg of that turf triple series in New York. And Gino, this is a really intriguing group of eight runners. I would say a stronger race from top to bottom than the first leg of this series, the Belmont Derby. Yeah, this is a, a really contentious race. I think a, a good betting race as well. I want to give you a little bit of a shout out, David, because last Saturday in the betting strategies at shop.drf.com, you had a really good Saturday. So I, th I think you're trying to build that same momentum up this week because uh, anyone who was playing those betting strategies last week made a little bit of money. Let's see if you can give it to us again this weekend with that really excellent analysis as uh, I, I will take a little bit of a swing here for a price. So that'll be a tease as we get closer and closer to our picks. Well, we'll see. These Saturday cards at Saratoga come up pretty tough, and this one on Whitney Day is no different. And I think this is one of those races that is especially difficult for handicappers because you could make cases for a lot of horses in this field. I pegged the number four, Diego Velasquez, as the slight favorite on the morning line at two to one, but I think there are some others drawn to his inside that are going to attract some support from the betters as well, going out for popular connections. So we'll see how the wagering shakes out in this race. Let's take a look at the time form U.S. pace projector to get a sense of how this race might be run through the early stages. Do note that the number four, Diego Velasquez, will not show up in the pace projector. Uh, the pace projector, obviously, based on the pace figures from North American races. He's making his first start in North America, so no pace data available for him. But watching his European races, he seems like a horse that is pretty versatile, can be placed in a stalking position. But we do have some other speed in this race, Gino. The two horses drawn down towards the inside are runners that I think are going to want to try to get forward. Yeah, in particular, the two Cugino, because this was a horse who had been knocking on the door. He had some trouble trips. He had some really tough beats. And then it seemed like a, the connections wanted to get aggressive and just kind of keep him out of some of that traffic and maybe see if a different trip would work out differently. And it did. It, in fact, he was a really nice stakes winner um, over at Churchill Downs. And with those new tactics, I always assume that when a horse shows tactics like that and it results in a victory, they're probably going to come back and try to do the same thing since it worked out so well. So I expect them to try to get aggressive again with Cugino. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch because there really was no other speed to go with him in that Audubon stakes. In this race, you've got the number one, Isidoro, who does his best running towards the front end, and the number eight, White Palomino, who has kind of led by default in a couple of recent races with slow paces, but he seems like a runner that might be a little bit more versatile than those two drawn down towards the inside. Well, let's go through this field in program number order, beginning with the number one, Isidoro, and he is the likely speed from the inside. Um, he led last time dueling early in that tail of the cat stakes before the entire field was mowed down by Carson's run in the late stages. He's just the outsider in this field from a form standpoint. He's going to have to get a little bit faster, run a little better against the uh, most accomplished field that he's ever met in this race, but we are likely to know him early. Yeah, and if you're playing a long shot, at least you know you'll probably get a good run for your money with the horse who's going to get you know get into the race early on. But he just hasn't run fast enough in here, David. And both of the wins came in pretty soft trips towards the front end. And as you were pointing out, I don't know if that's going to happen in here because it's probably him and maybe two other speeds. And even with a horse like uh, White Palomino to the outside, while he may not be naturally as quick as the two inside horses, he has a very good speed rider aboard in Flavian Pratt who – does a good job of not letting others get loose on the front end or maybe keeping them honest from that outside too. So yeah, I just don't know if Izzy Dioro will get the type of trip he needs to be successful in here. And it's going to be most interesting to see how the trip works out for the number two, Kujino, who, as you said, led from gate to wire in the Audubon stakes last time, a change in tactics for him. He's a horse who had gotten some difficult trips, uh, raiding off the pace in a few recent starts, some wide trips, particularly in that Transylvania stakes three back, where he was an unlucky loser, also never saw the rail in the American turf two back, which was a race that was really dominated by horses who stayed towards the inside. So we'll see if Kujino is able to get forward and comfortable on the front end once again. And in this race, he definitely took a step forward from a speed figure standpoint last time. And that's a race that when you look through the runbacks in Formulator, horses have come back to validate that number. Yeah, and uh, 
he's always been a talented horse. Like he's done very little wrong in his entire career. As gamblers, we always remember the bad beats much more than the the good victories. I needed this horse pretty badly in back-to-back races, and then in particular in the Transylvania. And it's funny because the way the horse is spelled, it was basically saying "see you, Gino" to me when he when he beat me that day. It was like <laughs> slapping me right in the face. So I, I like this horse every time I see him. He kind of reminds me of that, and I'm glad they got aggressive with him last time out because he he had ability. He just needed the right type of trip. And as you were pointing out, I. I respect him as a horse. I respect his ability. I'm just a little bit concerned about him getting that same exact trip in here with a couple others who could make life more difficult. So while I don't just toss him or dismiss him, I think it might be a little harder for him to get that same trip. I will use him more of an underneath and in the mix horse, but not on top. The number three legend of time is a horse who has been very popular with the better since coming over for Charlie Appleby to race in a three North American starts. We'll take a look at his most recent one of those in the Belmont Derby last time where White Palomino is on the lead. We'll get to him a little bit later in this rundown. The three um, legend of time, who's the one on this day, was in behind horses and has a little bit of trouble trying to angle out mid stretch. Royal Majesty, who's also back in this race, trying to keep him locked in, but also the pace of this race worked against him trickery and white palomino just able to control on the front end through very moderate fractions to the early stages of this belmont derby and legend of time just couldn't get there in the end he ran well to get the victory too back in the penine ridge coming through along the inside under Joel rosario a very confident ride that day from Kinda joel similar trips right he, he really those two I, and he's a horse who probably is going to try to get lucky coming through on the inside once again, drawn well in post three. He just has to get a little faster. And I feel like this is a much tougher feel than the one he encountered last time in that Belmont Derby. I think you and I are very similar on him too. Well, I respect his ability and I think he's kind of like a measuring stick for a lot of this field. This just seems like a much better field. And I feel like whatever his win chances are, he's just going to be shorter value than those win chances in this race because of the connections, because of how much they get bet. So while it wouldn't shock me to look up and see him in the mix, I'm going to be against him in this spot just based on value. I think there are some others that are more intriguing that might be double his price. Like one of the horses that you picked on top, one of the horses that I pick on top when we go to our selections at the end. So um, I'm going to be a little cold on Legend of Time, more based on value than his actual ability. I agree. There are things to like about him. I would set fair odds on him closer to five to six to one. And those prices just are not available for Godolphin, Charlie Appleby runners. Let's move on to the number four, Diego Velasquez. And we'll take a look at his most recent start over in Ireland uh, at Leopardstown in the Meld Stakes. This was a a group three event. Uh, Taking a step back, he had tried some tougher races, a pair of group ones to begin his season. Um, The group two, King Edward VII going a mile and a half. That's just not this horse's gig. Aiden O'Brien cut him back to the nine furlongs here over some good to firm ground and he really seemed to appreciate both the firmer going and the shorter distance as he does drift out a little bit in the stretch but is clearly just far superior to the group he's beating here and it's not like there was nothing behind him this day the runner-up Tarawa is a group two placed runner so he was beating a good horse by a significant margin seven lengths at the end of that I was looking at the time form ratings for this horse shows up as a 115 in the DRF formulator PP is actually elevated to a 120 when you put the weight adjustment on in time form us and typically uh, those numbers can increase a little bit when they come to the us so diego velasquez just based on the time form rating squarely fits against this field and we've seen aiden o'brien come over in recent years with ryan moore as the jockey and they are always dangerous yeah and they were keeping him kind of wide for a lot of that race i think they just didn't want him to battle up front they were just keeping him away from the pace setter it felt like they they were really confident with him in that race just confidently handled how they always felt like maybe he was traveling well um yeah i don't have very many knocks to him uh to him overall he's multiple group stakes winner who just raced a couple weeks ago i guess that would be my my major kind of nitpick with him is that he did race july 18th in Ireland and will be here pretty quickly racing at a short price. So uh, he is the horse to beat. No doubt about it. Is he the horse to bet? I don't know at a very short price. That'll probably be eight to five, seven to five in that range, maybe even less. So um, yeah, I think he's hard to leave out of multi exotics, but I think if you're looking for value, there's probably a couple other places that you could find a, a more fun horse to, to sink into.
Yeah, Aiden O'Brien did say in the winning interview for this uh, race, the last, the last race, I should say, that this horse might be a Cox Plate candidate for him. And for those that don't know, the Saratoga Derby is now, I think, a win and you're in for the Cox Plate. So maybe he's using that as a stepping stone there, as I think a Joseph O'Brien horse did a few years ago, that being state of rest and upset winner of this race. The number five is deterministic. And we'll take a look at his most recent start, his turf debut in the grade three Manila. And he's a horse who had been a little bit of a disappointment earlier this year on the dirt, looked like a potential triple crown contender uh, when uh, running in the Gotham Stakes, winning that race so impressively off the layoff, then disappointed in the Wood Memorial and the Peter Pan. But I think the connections always had to have in the back of their mind that maybe this is a horse that might have some turf inclination, definitely has the pedigree for that on the dam side, as well as the sire, Liam's map, an excellent turf influence. And I thought that Deterministic really took to the turf pretty well going the mile distance last time. That wasn't a race that featured very much pace at all. His main rival, Neat, got the jump on him. We're going to see Neat come back in the Hall of Fame on Friday. That's a pretty nice horse for Rob Atchison. Deterministic was getting to him at the end. Now he's stretching out to a mile and three sixteenths. Maybe that's a distance that on the turf is going to be more in his wheelhouse than it would have been on the dirt. And I think this is a horse that still has some upside second time on the turf. Yeah, if you're playing that common rival game with Neat, a lot of these horses in here have a form that is very similar to Deterministic. And so I think that effort first time on the turf fits really well. You set us up for deterministic with who he is. He was a horse who was good early on. We were hoping for a little bit more from him this year, a little flat, a little disappointing in some of the bigger races on the dirt, but they flip to the grass and then exactly what you're hoping for. When you make a surface change, you see that improvement. You see the spark after a horse had kind of tailed off for a few different races. And I think there's a lot to build off of that runner up effort on the grass. So yeah, I have very few knocks on deterministic and just from a value based standpoint, if you're trying to bet this race, he seems like one of the horses that I would circle in on and I'd zero in on if he is right in that five, six to one range. I think that's a very fair price. The number six is Carson's run. He is the other Christophe Clement trainee in this race. We'll take a look at his most recent victory when he got back on track in the tail of the cat after a weird just, uh, opening race to the season in the Woodhaven where he was very green and bore out at the top of the stretch. He still was wide at the top of the stretch in this tail of the cat, but kept a straighter course to get the job done here, just running away from some overmatched rivals through the late stages. This is a horse who showed some ability during his two-year-old season and got back to that big stretch kick uh, last time out. Yeah, and he's a little light on speed figures in here, but I think he's improving and I think he's heading in the right direction. I, I just liked his races and his body of work last year. I think it was a very good two-year-old. And it's always concerning when the first start at three, a horse does not run well like this because then you wonder, were they just precocious? Were they just a horse that was maybe ahead of the game? And did they not take that step forward? But I really did like the, uh, the Monmouth race that we just showed in the tail of the cat. He got a good trip that day, but he won like he was supposed to with that good trip. He sat behind the speeds. And then when he was able to launch an, an angle out wide, he was very impressive that day. If he takes one more small step forward here, that kind of puts him right in the range with a lot of these based on speed figures. And I think talent wise, he's certainly classy and he's certainly capable and just small things to point out. Like these are the types of horses all throughout the meet that Dylan Davis has been winning with. Like these, not your logical first tier horses but in that five to ten to one range where he's winning with a lot of very nice prices and um you know and you know ten dollar plus winners so uh, i think third start of the form cycle if carson's run takes one more step forward that could put him right in the range and as i'm kind of talking about this race i'm looking for horses that are going to be the price of like deterministic and him somewhere in that six eight to one range i that's how i'm going to approach playing this race a horse who might be an even bigger price than that is the number seven, Royal Majesty, who, for a horse that might be one of the longest shots on the board, is not untalented. He was an impressive allowance winner at Keeneland three starts ago. And you could say that he did not have ideal trips in either the Pennine Ridge or the Belmont Derby. The Pennine Ridge kind of had to alter course at the top of the stretch, where uh, the eventual winner, Legend of Time, was sneaking through traffic down towards the inside. And the Belmont Derby, while he didn't have any obvious trouble, he was never on the inside, was two to three wide around both turns chasing and that was a race like we said dominated towards the front end so I can make some slight excuses for him I'm still not totally convinced though about the quality of the Belmont Derby as a race overall and think this is a tougher spot yeah he doesn't feel that far below a lot of this group especially when you're just comparing speed figures and class 
but he will need a trip because I, I think you were kind of getting at it. His best races feel like when they just drop back and they can sit and make one late run. And in the smaller fields that he's been in lately, you, you just can't really do that. You have to be more tactical. You have to try to get involved more. He was actually the horse that was pinning in Legend of Time uh, in that last race and kind of impacted Legend of Time a little bit, probably kept him from winning that race. But yeah, if you're looking for ex uh, exotic horses in the tries, he's definitely that type of a horse for me. Is he good enough to jump up and win and beat three or four of these really nice horses all on the same day? I'm still not quite sure I'm there yet, but I can get into using him in the bottom of exotics. And the final horse coming out of the Belmont Derby and the last horse uh, in our rundown, the number eight, White Palomino in that outside post. Uh, I think the inclination with him looking at the Pennine Ridge and the Belmont Derby is to say that, oh, he was just setting slow paces and he was lucky to be second both times. But we did see some more versatility from him when he broke his maiden at Keeneland. He seemed fine stalking the pace that day. I don't think he's a horse that needs to be on the lead to have success. I think he just fell into those trips the last couple of times. And He's going to be the rare Chad Brown horse that might be a decent price in this race, even though he's the lone representative for that barn. And he does have an upward trajectory coming in here. I'm not going to be surprised when he runs well. I just, again, I'm a little bit concerned about the horses coming out of the Belmont Derby facing a tougher assignment this time. Yeah, and just watching that race, late in the race, he was actually, he got passed, but he was coming back on Chikari a little bit. And if you're someone who likes gallop outs, he was very strong on the gallop out. He galloped out way in front of the winner that day. So, you know, he's a horse that maybe there's another gear or maybe even a little more upside. We shouldn't feel like distance should be a problem for him. But I keep kind of getting to where you're getting. Like, I'm trying to map out the trip in my head. Does he sit a little wide from the outside? I mean, he can sit off the pace. I think I came down to just not thinking he was quite as good as some of the others, and he's probably not going to get the trip that he needs to win it. So I put those together, and I had him more of an under type, but a, a very strong connections play here as Pratt has had a fantastic meeting. And I was kind of pointing out one of the things in watching Flavian through the years in Southern California too, like in Southern California, you have to be a very good on the lead, small fields, a lot of dirt racing. You just have to do that. And Pratt has such a good clock as far as, the early pace of races. He's one of those that takes horses and he puts them on the front end or he knows when to make that early middle move. So he's just, he's scary when he's on a, a horse like this who has some tactical speed because he's really, really sharp. And sometimes he can win races uh, just when everyone else gets a little lazy or maybe gets a little like lull to sleep. So, he, you know, dismiss him at your own peril, but I just, I couldn't map it out in my head how they win this race. Well, let's throw up our picks for this Saratoga Derby. And we've both got Christoph Clement runners on top. I think you're going for the one that is going to be a bigger price in Carson's run. And like you said, he's got to get a little faster from a speed figure standpoint, but he did take that step forward second off the layup. So maybe there's some, st still some upside with him. Yeah, it looks like uh, we approach this race very similarly to how we put our selections in. It's almost like the horses to beat are probably... Uh, you know, Diego Velasquez and Cugino, they're the horses who you feel the, like the safest with, you know, you kind of know you're going to get their race or their trip. But if, if you're looking for value and you're looking to bet, I think you and I may have sniffed out the two most intriguing horses in here. Uh, I have deterministic in the four spot, and that would absolutely be a horse I'm using in like that mandatory pay pick five or any of the multi exotic wagers. And, uh, and Carson's run, um, I had pointed out, I just think Third start off the bench, one more step forward. We have deterministic. He's got upside in just his second turf starts. Those two, the, the six and the five, they were the most intriguing from a gambling standpoint to me. I thought the safest in here were both Cugino and the four, Diego Velasquez. So I'll put them all together for the exotics. And I've got deterministic on top. We'll see what kind of price he is. Hoping for that six to one morning line. I won't be surprised if he goes a little bit lower than that because he is a horse that has some name recognition from that Gotham win early in the year. Um, but I'm just hoping the added distance brings out a little bit better in him on the turf. Sometimes just getting the feel for the turf, finding the turf footing first time out um, can result in a better uh, performance next time out when the horses race on the turf. And I think he's one that does still have some upside in his second grass start. So the number five, deterministic for me. And the number six, Carson's run for Gino in the grade one Saratoga Derby Invitational on Saturday. Good luck if you're playing the races this weekend.